On behalf of the Bluegrass Investors Group and all Fayette County short-term rental hosts, we would like to thank the Council for all of their hard work and efforts developing the current draft of short-term rental regulations and guidelines for Fayette County. I am co-owner of Kentucky Life Property Management, a full-service property management company for both SFRs and STRs located here in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm here today to speak on behalf of short-term rental operators and hosts to provide clarity and organization since our company is the largest entity to manage and operate short-term rentals in Fayette County. After a growing demand of to manage short-term rentals for our clients in November of 2018, we officially launched this new division within our company. Since launching our short-term rental division, we have welcomed thousands of guests from around the world to Central Kentucky. 2022 will be a record year for Kentucky Life as we have hosted over 4,000 guests year to date, and data shows 2022 will be a record year for all Fayette County hosts, the City of Lexington, and all Central Kentucky hosts. We are here today to support the efforts to make Lexington and its neighborhoods the best place to live, visit, and invest. As business owners and hospitable hosts, our mission is to work with the city to share the place many of us call home, while our direct competitors, hotels, are not owned by local citizens. The regulations proposed not only affect short-term rental hosts, but transcend far beyond those investing in short-term rentals. We have helped small businesses flourish through promoting Kentucky Proud and visiting local businesses. We have helped families and vendors increase their quality of life with consistent and good paying work. Hosts are able to start local businesses or provide for their families due to the success of being a host, and the list could go on and on. Our ecosystem of short-term rentals has become the prominent pillar of financial and growth success for our city. Because Fayette County allows short-term rentals, our city is able to accommodate larger events such as Breeders' Cup and provide quality lodging for thousands of spectators. Our company helped generate over $130,000 for clients in rental revenue the week of Breeders' Cup 2022. Our clients are able to reinvest back into our local economy due to such proceeds before the holidays and guests who drove sales at local restaurants, bars, retail shops, and other businesses. Overregulating could cause Fayette County to not have the lodging capacity to welcome such events. The prime example would be the World Equestrian Games. In a city that is faced with a huge lodging shortage, the short-term rental market has steadily grown over the past few years, on averaging welcome 30 new listings since 2016 per quarter. Guests from in-state, national, and international routes are all being hosted. Guests who are looking to truly live like a local and be engulfed into a diverse and ever-growing city. There is no denying it, our slice of heaven has become a global phenomenon. We are a short-term rental market, not a vacation rental market. We welcome circumstantial guests who want the comfort of a private home for a short period of time. Therefore, we have a vast array of types of guests, from bourbon and horse lovers, patients visiting host hospitals, families visiting loved ones, friends celebrating life, healthcare professionals such as traveling nurses, relocating companies bringing in new citizens who want to live like a local before deciding which district to purchase, and so much more. The group of hosts before you today are helping bring the neighbor back to the neighborhood. Our team alone has helped countless families who were once guests become local citizens, particularly after the COVID pandemic. We care about maintaining the neighborhood lifestyle and spend time and money to not only maintain the properties in which we rent out, but creating quality relationships with our neighbors, guests, and to further improve our city. Whether it is a UK alumni, parents visiting their kids, millennials traveling to experience the Bourbon Trail, a young girl from Ocala of Florida to attend an event at the horse park, or simply a couple from Harrodsburg, Kentucky coming into town for a concert, this new style of lodging allows guests of all different backgrounds an affordable way to live for a night or two in a city that we love. My passion for this industry and city could lead me to speak to you for hours, but I'm only granted 15 minutes, but I am going to allow my fellow hosts today to share their personal stories. This being said, we would like to have a conversation about some of the subjective matters of the conditional use permit application process. Specifically section 1313 F, A through D, it leaves too much open to personal interpretation. The applications for conditional use permits are contingent upon issues outside of the short-term rental owner's control. It is simply subjective with no true measurable or time constraints. These were all items of concerns we discussed in our advisory panel with two of the council members. Board of Adjustments takes into an account certain conditions, the conditional use permit. Subjective remove the conditional use permit and have the permit be by right through the ZOTA as approved by the Article 3 draft based on general zoning regulations. We would like to eliminate the need for a two-step permit. The current proposal requires conditional use permit 
and a license. This seems a bit redundant and cumbersome to administer. Conditional use permits become subjective and oftentimes political. While we welcome standards and regulations, we do feel that this takes immediate power away from short-term rental hosts. By eliminating the conditional use permit, you are still able to set up regulations and measurables, not just opinions or personal agenda. Having all short terminals apply for a license as outlined in the draft of code, a few sections of the code can be considered an overreach and not equitable for owner occupants, long-term and short terminals alike. Specifically, 13-777, relating to the number of vehicles that can be at the residence. Homeowners and tenants frequently use street parking. How can we expect guests of short terminals to visit and not be afforded this same option? Many of our downtown or unique Fayette County units also have limited parking or no parking at all. We as hosts also encourage the use of paid parking while visiting downtown, and some locations based on parking are required to pay parking. Transportation is an area of concern for Fayette County residents and guests already. By regulating parking, you are crippling certain short-term rentals because our city does not have the means of transportation, requiring many of our guests the needs of personal or rented vehicles while they are visiting our city. 1379A8. The wording describes the license as being in jeopardy if a crime has been occurred. We would like that to read with a more reasonable verbiage, specifically if this is a pattern. What is the number? What is the timeline? Again, measurables and not subject to opinion. 13-79-A8. Remove the removable, removal of a license due to parameters listed. This is not applied currently to long-term rentals, which can be argued have a more detrimental effect than someone staying less than the average of three nights. Background checks are already required for such platforms like Airbnb and Verbo. We as hosts need specifics about a number of episodes in a certain time frame. We are operating small businesses and need to be able to set clear expectations with our guests, our neighbors, and booking platforms. Other areas of concerns restricting the short-term rentals from being used in agricultural zones. This will present issues particularly if farms have additional structures that were not formally being used. This is a way for farmers to generate yearly income to offset expenses and utilize the structures that were previously costing them money rather than bringing in income. Why should this demographic be penalized? We also have concerns about limiting the number of short-term rentals based on zone, geographical area, or structure. Downtown will always be an epicenter for a city for short-term rentals. From there, short-term rentals typically sprawl based on roadways, landmarks, tourist attractions, parks, hospitals, and airports. By limiting or placing constraints, what does this resolve? For some instances, this will place financial burden on existing short-term operators based on these guidelines. Questions that we have. Can the license be transferred during the sale of a property with the new homeowner receiving a new license number and paying the registration fee? Will the current short-term rental owners be grandfathered into a license? We understand the need to pay fees and abide by safety and code requirements. With just like an expedited license with no interruption of our business or ability to fulfill obligations to booked guests. Many of the hosts before you today have calendars open six to 12 months in advance with bookings well into 2023. If our licensing would not go through, this could place financial burden through cancellations, guests with no place to stay, and with over 1,100 rentals in the market right now, if you do not grandfather them, then what is the time constraints to get them all approved? What is the timeline for the license pro process for future applications? At the end of the day, time is money, particularly when it comes to real estate investments. If we're averaging 30 rentals per quarter, how are you all able to do that and get those through in a timely manner? Does the city have a plan to staff for this influx of work and be able to enforce any approved regulations? What is this task force projected to look like? I close with this. What is the true reason for regulating short-term rentals? If it is to fix a housing shortage in Fayette County, this is not the answer. Studies of over-regulated or zoned communities point to some of the main issues that lead to housing issues that our nation faces today. This isn't a tax issue because the city of Lexington is in agreement with Airbnb and Verbo. All taxes are paid for and at the time of check-in and remitted by these platforms from the guest. 
The 4% tax that Visit Lex receives is a large contributor to the marketing funds annually that they use to drive tourism. According to AirDNA, Visit Lex is estimated to receive well over seven figures from short-term rentals in 2022. Such proposed regulations could force short-term rental hosts to invest surrounding markets, taking revenue away from Fayette County. I kindly ask you to consider the future of Lexington and its host. Do not pass something through just to receive a vote, an accomplishment before the changeover of council in January. January, many cities who have overregulated have slowed down growth and progression. Over 60% of all guests using short-term platforms are millennials. They want automation, simplicity, cost-effectiveness, and amenities. Guests staying in short terms are given the chance to live like a local and truly experience the Kentucky way of life. Vague and unclear regulations could cripple the particular revenue component that the city, its businesses, and residents rely on more than they realize. This is an expectations, management, education, and communication issue. Just like anything, change is hard. Some will agree and others will always disagree. My team collectively has over 40 years of management experience and we see far more long-term rentals being used and abused, not kept up, tarnishing property value, appearance, and stimulating negative effects into our community. We are receiving more repeat guests now who are choosing to stay because of the amenities these styles of lodging offer and their newfound love for Lexington. In a result, these guests are spending more time and money outside of the home and in the community. This is positively affecting our economy and stimulating growth. I leave you with this. Take our client's stories into consideration. A middle-aged couple whose daughter has graduated from the University of Kentucky that had a condo that presented a financial burden. With the intentions to sell, they learned they can rent their condo to guests, resulting in income for expenses and still have the, come to the city they love for sporting events and leisure. A young group of investors who have renovated a historic home that is booked on average of 70% a month with four separate units. Because of this return, they are able to reinvest in multiple multifamily complexes in the city of Lexington for long-term residents, creating quality, safe, and affordable housing. A young couple purchased a dilapidated home that sat vacant for years with drug homeless activity in the heart of downtown, revitalized it into a new home. This has increased property value and positive growth for an area that was in desperate need, helping clean up the neighborhood for its neighbors who live next door on either side for over 20 years. We can all agree that Lexington has taken great strides over the years and continues to flourish. Thank you to our city leadership and our community, we continue to rank in the top of many categories. With such great progress and so many steps forward, let's not allow this to suspend or stop this movement forward. Let's allow this momentum to continue driving us all closer to the vision for our city. We have accomplished so much together. Let me emphasize, we want to be for our community, for our neighbors, for growth, and for progress. I encourage you to shift your mindset and perspective on hosts and any negative stereotypes you may have surrounding short-term rentals. We are your partners and we are your neighbors. We are asking for support to help us allow to be the vision carriers for the city and be a part of the bigger vision and future growth. We are business owners and take great pride in representing our city. While this entire room welcomes the conversation of adding rules or regulations, I hope we all welcome different perspectives so we can collectively accomplish what's best for everyone. I ask that we do, not, we do to regulate but not destroy, protect and not abolish, and discuss and not overlook for the simple satisfaction of a vote with no clear resolution of what truly needs to be fixed. Thank you. Applause. No, no applause, y'all. We try to. Part of our decorum is uh, uh, no open gestures or applause. So thank you. <laughs> Very well said, Heath. All right. Next on the list is um, Elijah Zimmerman. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have the unfortunate thing of following Heath here, so, but um, uh, good to meet everybody tonight. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Elijah Zimmerman. I'm coming to you as a super host myself, uh, but uh, as an employee of Miles Partnership that does all the state tourism marketing uh, for the state of Kentucky, as well as 50 other destinations globally. Um, <clears throat> 
And so with that, I wanted to speak a little bit about our, our tourism impact and our numbers compared to pre-pandemic and, and how we are uh, making improvements and trying to strive back to 2019 numbers. Um, overall, Kentucky is still down 8.4% on lodging compared to 2019 numbers, and that's uh, total lodging spend. Um, that is done by our partners at Longwoods, an independent research study that was able to measure that for the entire state of uh, Kentucky. Um, obviously being uh, instilling more regulations and as Heath mentioned that can somewhat be uh, subjective as well there are no uh, guidelines uh, for how conditional permits can be per, uh, given um, there's no capacity there's no uh, percentage based on neighborhood and so um, time is money right and so we, if we go to purchase a house but we don't know how long that is before that can be rented um, we're taking um, we're taking uh, heads and beds and room nights out of the equation. Um, kind of parlaying that into what, what ends up happening and as we see like um, moving money out of the county, which is um, actually a business partner and I are doing that with the increased regulations in Fayette County, we'll be, we're building six cabins in the gorge. And so we're able to have um, six cabins, inventory of 180 nights per month, um, for less than what we can buy in Lexington, but also be able to have very specific um, uh, ways to build community, eco-friendly tourism, uh, incorporate other parts of business like venues the, into that. And so um, part, of, part of that is just the trickle down effect that comes from hiring cleaners, hiring cooks, hiring um, experiential folks to come in and give specialized bourbon tours um, that we're capable of doing right now in Lexington that would be regulated out through this. So uh, I'll yield my time on that, um, but um, hoping that we, uh, we have a great, great starting point. So thank you all for the time and look forward to seeing where this goes. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, next up <clears throat> is uh, Chris Benzet. Am I saying that right? And I just want to remind you to, um, to share your name and your council district. My name is Chris Benazet, uh, District 4. I think that regulation is good. Um, I think he had some great points. I think we just need to work as a team, both as business owners and as you know, city leaders, and try to come to a, a fair resolution on this. I really just came down to listen. I wanted to hear pros and cons. I'm sure there's going to be cons as well. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, next is Miranda Henchman. Hi, how are you all? Um, I'm in Division or District 4. Um, I actually sent an email earlier. So um, I bought a house over off of Darley Drive, and when I bought it, it was in complete disrepair. I introduced myself to all my neighbors. I gave them my name, I gave them my phone number, and every time I went to someone nearby, they said, well, you know the house on this side of you, there's drug activity, they're selling drugs. I mean, and I heard it from like five neighbors. Well, I can tell you that no one is more vigilant than a short-term rental owner. We know who's coming, who's going. I have cameras all the way around my property. I was able to share that with the police department so that they could have unfettered access and have that information and that was quickly resolved. Um, not only do I work really hard to maintain my property, I work very hard to be a good neighbor. I do feel like I'm a steward of our community and let's face it, this is hospitality and it's Southern hospitality. How often does the hotel say, well, what brings you in and are they putting a bouquet of flowers on the kitchen table for you and your wife because you said it was your anniversary? I had a couple that said they're bringing their pets. I mean, can you bring, you know, both your dogs to a hotel and let them run around in the backyard and enjoy the fire pit? You just can't. It's a different experience. And I was that host that when they said we're only bringing one, we lost one that I left them a card. It's a completely different experience and it's experience that people want. I've hosted local people who have had insurance claims of fire or flood that are local and need a place to stay, need a long-term place to stay, and a safe place for their, their pets to bring with them. Let's face it, they're part of our family. 
I've hosted uh, parents coming in to visit UK that want to bring the family pet. I'm, I'm a pet lover, so I'm cool with it. Some people aren't. But I've hosted a lot of people, and we get to share so much about our community, as well as people from out of town that get to enjoy Keeneland and to get to enjoy our restaurants. I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, what do you recommend for this? And I'm like, I'll, I'll give you a whole list. I love to eat. So it's those experiences that we get to share with people and the support that we get to bring back into our community. So I would venture to guess that actually you're going to find a lot of people here tonight that are really improving our communities and we're being great neighbors and improving our neighborhoods. And we want to be, I mean, we're giving out our name and our phone number. We don't want people calling the Airbnb and the VRBO. They will police you. They'll just shut you down if they hear something you don't like. We want those people to have our name, to have our number, to be satisfied, to be happy, and to feel like we've improved the neighborhood. So um, that's, that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Stephanie Dalton. Okay. Good evening. I was hoping I could pass. So many great things have already been said. I was, maybe I'll be at the bottom of the list. Um, my husband and I, we live, uh, we're in District 12. We have five other homes in District 1, District 8, and District 3. Um, we have two sons graduated uh, locally. One's graduated from Univers University of Kentucky, business, finance, the other's still there. They both have the real estate license. We just really love the city of Lexington. During COVID, we had some extra time and thought, hey, what do we want to do? We'd flipped homes in the past um, and started to kind of get involved in that again and really fell in love once again with the neighborhoods of Lexington, whether it's going to Rupp Arena for a game or the local coffee shop or bookstore. Lexington really offers some incredible opportunities for community. And so we've just really been excited to be a part of that process with Lexington. Um, we, we, um, we also partner with the Lexington Rescue Mission. We have several workers that come from there that work in our homes. Um, we've helped them find housing. We've helped them stabilize their income resource. I would say on a monthly basis, there are probably 10 families that help feed their families because of the work that we do among our STRs and flipping homes in the Lexington community. We're just really blessed to be a part of this community. Thank you for serving. Thank you. And no pressure, but if somebody feels like somebody made their point for them and they want to pass on speaking, we won't bite you. <laughs> but don't feel pressure to do that. Uh, next is... Is it Mary and Dalton? Okay. And if I, like I said, if I say your name wrong, don't, don't get mad at me, just correct me. All right, thank you. Well, as you can tell, I'm married up, right, with Steph. She's amazing. Uh, we, we do love our community. We've been in this community for 24 years. And a few other things to do with being in the different neighborhoods we love, building relationships with the families there. We've taken three homes that have been boarded up for 10 plus years in neighborhoods and turned them into beautiful properties that the neighbors just they, they're really amazed at what it's done for the neighborhood, and it's so awesome to build those relationships and see neighborhoods start to come up and to be able to invest back. And like Steph said also, helping with missions, helping with other things and means. And it, it's really for our, our city, uh, when you really think about it, I, we, we travel a lot as well. It's so awesome to invite people to Lexington and all the things we offer, like it's been mentioned with bourbon trails and all these other things and horses and all that. And we just really are concerned that with the very vague regulations that have been uh, submitted, or have been discussed, it could really just crush what we do. I mean, we, if we have to go through zoning to do this, forget it, just sell your properties. You know, you, who's got time to do that? You're, you're landlocked, you can't do anything. We don't, as individual operators, don't have the kind of means to say, oh, we want to spend $5,000 for an attorney to get a conditional use permit. I mean, that's just, that just puts us out. And the other thing is, is for 
staying in the community through retirement and benefiting our families, as you all know, with the stock market and where IRAs are, well, you own a tangible property. You're also benefiting the community and you're benefiting people for employment, helping with employment, but it also gives you an income so that you could someday retire and enjoy a little bit of what you've done. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Julie Logan. Hello, Julie Logan, just a citizen. I don't own any properties except where I live. Um, I don't have a lot to say that hadn't already been said. Uh, my concern is that this community that everybody is so big on won't exist if we have Motel 6s on every block. Uh, I don't like short-term rentals. Uh, I don't think that's gonna change the fact that we have them, but I think uh, they have their downside also. I don't want that many cars parked on my street. I don't want cars parked in yards. I mean, it's that way just when we have UK ball games around my neighborhood, but I can put up with that. It's, you know, like 10 games a year or something. It's not that bad, but I think we really need to hold it down. That's my opinion. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Logan. Uh, next is Stephanie Clark. Hello, my name is Stephanie Clark. I'm here for Gregory Clark. He's a short-term rental owner and he couldn't be here this afternoon as he couldn't get off work in time. He asked that I read this for him. He and I work together on these short-term rentals. I wish he could be here. He's got the Irish brogue and he's a lot more charming than I am. <laughs> um, anyway, he said, my name is Gregory Clark and I was born and raised in Ireland. Lexington has been my home for nearly 40 years. Several years ago, I got involved with short-term rentals because I love houses, particularly old houses and houses that have interesting stories and interesting previous owners. I enjoy renovating them and meticulously returning them to their former glory. I am a good and considerate neighbor in each of the neighborhoods where I own property. I employ local build, builders, cleaning companies, caterers, limo companies, decorators, landscaping companies, and many other local businesses in my aim to keep and maintain my houses and service my guests. Short-term rentals have helped me to sustain the cost of remodeling, and I've discovered that I enjoy it, and my neighbors have told me that they appreciate the work I've done in restoring these homes. I've met numerous wonderful guests from all over the world through short-term rentals, and I consider myself as one of our city's ambassadors. I organize shuttles, bourbon tours, horse farm tours, restaurant reservations, and offer my services as a guide on a walking tour of the city. I live here, I work here, I spend money here, I pay taxes here, I provide jobs for people who live here, on t I, I, pay, I provide jobs for people who live here, spend money here, and pay taxes here. On top of that, I bring in people from out of town who love to spend their money in Lexington. 40% of my guests are repeat visitors. Last week, I had four out-of-town families have their Thanksgiving dinners in my homes. Three of those families had no, con no connection to Lexington, but were referrals from previous guests. If you try to make our hosting more difficult or limit our ability to host these guests, then these families will only go someplace else to spend their disposable income. So my question today is what is broken and what are we trying to fix? Are out-of-town owners putting pressure on everyone to change how we have successfully hosted guests in this beautiful city? It seems to me that we are trying to solve a problem that simply doesn't exist. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next is Amelia Barnett. I'm sorry, to who? Mary Michael Burnett. Okay. Mr. Burnett? You have six minutes. Hey, how are you? Hope everyone's well. Um, a little bit about me, my background. Uh, my father moved here in, in the 1970s, and we purchased... Um, some, I guess you would call them dilapidated properties on West Maxwell Street uh, in 40508 downtown. Um, 
you know, it's probably the same stories a lot of people hear. You know, it's been very difficult for me to help keep a roof over their head because of their medical needs, being as, you know, they're 77 and they uh, struggle with dementia and blindness and stuff like that. So the added income um, from Airbeat or from short-term rental has really helped uh, and us be able to continue to live here in this uh, area that we like so much, which is downtown. And um, one of our properties was actually built as a, um, a, a boarding house for the train station that used to be in Rupp Arena's lower lot. And there's about nine units. And because of the small space and the historic nature of the property, it was very difficult for us to find people who would rent those as apartments so i've you know recently i've got into airbnb and um, str i guess you would call it and uh, i think that it's like a perfect it's like a godsend for me and my family and um, so i'd like to, hopefully you guys could consider that when i see under the like r2 uh, zoning you have a limitation of three units um, i would hope that that would be could be increased being as it's like a three, four story building and um, there's like, I don't know, at least 7,000 square feet in the building. And um, because of uh, the historic nature of these properties too, it's also very expensive to maintain the properties as far as windows, paint, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone who lives downtown knows how expensive these historic properties are. And um, really I've figured out that there's, no other way um, to get enough money to um, to work on these a lot of these historic homes and Victorian homes that we have downtown. You need that stream of revenue to keep the place basically inhabited in an inhabitable condition. And um, uh, so that, I guess that's all I have to say about that point. Um, and I would hope that. Um, I think that the legislation needs a grandfather clause. I know in a lot of other cities that have had has had similar um, regulations um, have had a grandfather clause. So I would hope that you know someone would second that, and maybe that would get some more attention. And um, with that, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. Uh, next up is uh, Burgess Carey. You have nine. Nine minutes. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you all for your time and efforts in looking into this. My name is Burgess Carey. Uh, some of you may know me as the owner of Boone Creek Outdoors, an ecotourism and outdoor recreation facility out Old Richmond Road in the Clays Ferry area. But I'm here to represent the Clays Ferry Neighborhood Association, of which I'm the chair. Um, and I want to ask a question just to be sure. The ag rural and ag natural zones were left out of this. Was that intentional? So I don't, I don't want to start a trend, Mr. Okay. Carey, uh, answering well, questions, but well, I, I think we're going to address it when council starts deliberating. Well, so mind. the Clays Ferry Neighborhood Association was created and accepted by the Lexington uh, Fayette Urban County government because our neighborhood faces unique challenges from the interstate exit 99, the overhead lights, traffic, noise, and constant crime. But we uh, also have unique opportunities because of the river. If you're at all familiar with this area, you'll know that most of the homes in the Clays, Clays Ferry neighborhood are non-conforming lots, under 40 acres, most of them even under 20 or 10. Homes historically built around the commerce from US 25, I 75, and the river. And even the lots larger than 40 acres in our area in the Palisades are not productive agricultural properties. They're certainly not horse farms. However, these properties are largely zoned AR. Also, as most of you know, this area has developed as a unique opportunity to show off a distinctly different part of our county with restaurants, wineries, Boone Creek Outdoors, and just recently the city purchased a large parcel on the river to provide public access 
which otherwise is not available. And the Palisades area is spectacular. As these homes and parcels are too small to be considered for the PDR program, there is no, other, there is no threat that the PDR or its assessment and purchase prices will be affected. So if as a uh, community we are promoting tourism, and I think that's been the consistent theme here, why would we remove this potential income stream from the homeowners in the, in the Clays Ferry area to consider this additional way to better take care of their property and provide a much needed option for tourists wanting to stay and see this different part of Fayette County, which by the way, it is historic and is the reason our signature brands exist. A word about Boone Creek Outdoors, and some of you may remember the very difficult uh, process we went through to become uh, <laughs> legal. We are now the number one outdoor attraction in Central Kentucky. We have hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews on TripAdvisor and Google. Uh, we uh, do a majority of our business to guests from out of state, and we are consistently asked where can we stay? And where can we stay in the countryside? Now, finally, I'd like to suggest that the AR zone and the horse farms will also lose out if they're not able to use this tool to help preserve their property and offer a unique immersive experience with short stays on a horse farm. What a wonderful way to promote our signature in industry. However, I hope that this effort is not being driven and is not another attempt to devalue farms in the AR. Once federal, since federal and maybe local, I'm not sure, restrictions on eligibility for the purchase of development rights program require eliminating the STR. So if all the properties in the rural area are prohibited from having short-term rentals, the evaluations will be less expensive than if this right exists. So, again, there are hundreds and hundreds of lots uh, under 40 acres in this county, not just in Clays Ferry, but with the significant investment that the city has already made in developing that area and with the non-conforming nature of these lots, Taking this potential income stream could certainly dampen and uh, maybe even prevent uh, the further growth of this valuable tourism attraction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, next is Walt Gaffield. Uh, I'm Walt Gaffield. I'm president of the Fayette County Neighborhood Council. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Council Member Brown and Council Member Sheehan for at least working on this effort and thanking Council for considering it. It was first recommended in Lexington probably 10 or 12 years ago, and, it's, and there, there are problems that need to be dealt with. That doesn't mean I oppose short-term rentals. I've probably been staying in Airbnbs almost, almost from their inception, and I like them but that doesn't mean that something doesn't need to happen to regulate them. Um, licensing and inspection of rental properties is a really high priority uh, for the neighborhood council and has been for a very long time. Uh, problems, however, are becoming a little bit more widespread and there's a really kind of a lack of planning and regulation at all. So, so I think something needs to be done. There are problems with housing availability, uh, affordability, nuisances, uh, and, and really displace, displacement of Lexington residents. Now, do I, do I oppose really good operators of short-term rentals uh, where it's not where there's no bother or in neighborhoods? No, I don't necessarily oppose them, uh, but it's, it's a hard issue, it's difficult. 
the text of the Zoda wasn't really available until November the 17th, right before the Thanksgiving holiday. And we started really to work on it and think about it. And we have tons of questions and uh, uh, really recommendations, but we really have to have more public engagement. Now that could be with council, it could be with uh, uh, planning staff and the planning commission. Uh, it, it could be with other stakeholders in other neighborhoods. We probably won't be able to talk about it with all our neighborhoods until a general meeting, maybe in mid-January. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a problem that way because we simply didn't know what was in the text. We didn't even know there was a work group, work group out there since February or March or whenever it was. Uh, but we're thoroughly willing to engage and work closely with, Hoover, with whomever wants to work with us. We think this is a very important issue. It needs to be done fairly. There are a lot of different points of view on it. It's not easy. Uh, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and I've, again, I very much appreciate, appreciate your consideration of at least starting to work on it in a, in a fair way, an equitable, equitable way. And, we become a better planned community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Janet Cabanis. Did I say the last name right? You no, ma'am. No, ma'am. I didn't say that. <laughs> difficult name to have these days you know it didn't start out that way but this is now <laughs> at any rate my name is Janet Cabanis and I live in the Stonewall area in District 9 uh, I'm in Fayette County Neighborhood Council myself and Walt has pretty much said most of the things that I want to say only he said them better than I am going to say them um, so I I echo what he had to say I did want to express to the council my gratitude for getting started on this long-term challenge. And I know it's a challenge. Uh, Neighborhood Council has been asking for this for years, so thank you. It's not fun. I think before we get it right, we're going to have to have many, many more public input meetings. Perhaps we should restrict the topics of the public, uh, public input to those who have concerns about parking or other topics, you know, investment or um, uh, uh, whatever. I mean, there are a lot of topics in here, as you can tell from the length of your uh, presentation that, was, that we did receive. Um, but thank you definitely for your input and for your interest. Thank you for being a council that will pay attention to these things and the new council is going to be challenged, isn't it? <laughs> I'm afraid. Okay, my conclusion is that this issue is not really ready for prime time, but I do appreciate you being here and, and being interested in it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cam. Miss <laughs> 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 <Ms>. Janet. <laughs> All right, next up, and I'm gonna call, <clears throat> I'm going to call a couple of people so you can get ready and, and line up and go right behind the next person. So uh, next is Nancy Cristiano. Then after her is Chris Hadawis. Houston. And then Alexandria Hazel. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Nancy Cristiano. I'm in District 10. My husband and I operate a hosted Airbnb uh, situation, which is a little different than a lot of the other speakers today, in that we host in our home in an additional bedroom suite that we have. We've been excellent ambassadors for Lexington through hosting. All guests are vetted by us and Airbnb, of course. They enter and exit the suite through a common entrance to our home, and they park in our driveway. We have strict house rules regarding quiet hours and other aspects that might affect the behavior of our guests, which could possibly negatively impact our neighborhood. We don't wanna do that. We live there. <laughs> 
We have safety protocols in place, fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, fire blankets, exit diagrams, and a security system. I support those recommendations in the um, proposals. The economic impact of Airbnb is realized through many avenues, including the restaurants and tourist attractions that we recommend to our guests. We are within the hospital triangle and then also in the vicinity of the airport and Keeneland. Um, we get a lot of guests seeking our advice on where to go and what to do. We provide a vast collection of printed material from, from the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce and um, local attractions and restaurants. Many of our guests are medical professionals or physicians conducting residency interviews at the University of Kentucky or working there as traveling medical professionals. The Airbnb experience provides an excellent opportunity for hospitality to these professionals who are in the decision-making process of investing in Lexington or not. These professionals will buy homes, have children in school, attend local events, dine, and I'd like to note that during COVID, we only hosted medical professionals due to the um, need of them at the University of Kentucky and surrounding hospitals. Um, we offered them a 50% reduced rate for that reason. The passive income that Airbnb provides to us has enabled us to make improvements to our home, such as a new roof, solar panels, and professional landscape design. These improvements increase home values, not just for us, but for the entire neighborhood. The secondary and tertiary effects of these improvements are seen in local business and their employees who we've hired to do our work. The social impact of Airbnb is just that, it's social. In a world where people have become isolated and unfriendly, Airbnb gives us the opportunity to be engaging and hospitable. This reflects positive positively on Lexington, and we are proud to be ambassadors of our town. We provide recommendations for everything. Uh, one thing that I would like to note um, with your changes. So, Ms. the Cristiano, collection of a $200 fee. You're out of time, can you wrap up? Yes, yes, I would like, uh, yes. yes. So um, Louisville currently charges $100 for an Airbnb. Um, we have been operating under a business license in Fayette County that, that costs $100. Um, a $200 fee with an additional $100 fee for another unit, like if we rent out a second bedroom, um, seems like an exorbitant fee to us. And does that include then the cost of the remaining business license? Because then that puts us at $400. Um, Reporting. Uh, hotels don't have to report their guests and how many stays they have. That is, that is a unnecessary requirement that is labor intensive for a host and, and we should not be held to a higher standard than you know, a hotel. If they're not reporting, why should we have to report? You're getting the revenue from Airbnb and all of the taxes. Yes, ma'am. I'm, thank I'm you. sorry. I'm going to cut you off. Yeah. All right. Thank, All right. You. thank you. I just want it. I just it, it should be fair and equitable to the Airbnb hosts. Yes, ma'am. And those two things are are not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hustis. I'm sorry. I said your name wrong. You're not the first. Um, my name is Chris Hustis. I'm from District 11. Ditto and ditto. Um, the proposal you have on short-term rentals comes from throwing it at us not from working with us to create policies for short-term rentals, the Airbnbs. This is not working in harmony with the community. I don't know any hosts that have worked with you to make this proposal. The question is, why should you regulate a business class that is already regulated? The answer is obvious. It benefits the hotels and the big landlords. Many local hotels are already getting millions in government sub subsidies and tax breaks. It is because they are, is it because they are so, such badly run businesses that they can't make it on their own, that they need this money? The proposal 
that helps, this proposal helps big corporate interests and hurts small locally owned businesses. These small businesses put nearly 100% of their profits into the local economy, whereas much of the big corporate profit goes out of state. This is economic apartheid, a double standard. It punishes the local, locally owned short-term rentals, the Airbnb hosts for doing the right thing, paying taxes and maintaining their properties. Meanwhile, for decades, the absentee slumlords around the University of Kentucky create havoc and are a danger to the community by allowing poor maintenance, overcrowding, street crash, trash, street crack, and, and even violence. The Lexing Lexington does little to stop this with code enforcement. This proposal divides the community. If you want to put us out of business, then buy us out like you have done with the horse farms by purchasing their development rights. I will sell you mine for $1 million. <laughs> the hosts for Airbnbs and other short-term rentals are ambassadors for Lexington. The arguments that Airbnbs increase rental rates at apartment complexes is a false argument. Greed does. The council could enact rent stabilization ordinances that could prevent rental rates from skyrocketing. Other cities do this and it works. But that would mean standing up to big landlords. Just as council members that have Airbnbs must recuse themselves from voting on this proposal, then any council member that has a hotel and or rental real estate interest must also recuse themselves from participating in this ordinance. For instance, the Breeders' Cup benefited from coming to Lexington. The Airbnbs helped make that possible for out-of-town visitors and employees from out-of-town that work the Breeders' Cup. What are they supposed to do next time? Camp out at Keeneland like Woodstock? I don't think so. Lexington makes good sense for the Breeders' Cup economically. It's cheaper here than California and New York. Do not pass this ordinance, any of it. We already have plenty of big government regulations. Think of all the homeowners that would benefit from renting out a room or two in their house, an extra eight to $10,000 a year annually or more would help those that are facing the danger of economic insecurity. That is no small thing to us. It is our jobs and homes that are at stake. I have a guest, a traveling nurse, uh, he's an ICU nurse who's here for a few, few weeks. If you stop the ICU nurses from having an affordable place to stay, the hospitals will have to unplug their patients and say, sorry, no can do. In a pandemic, really? No oh. thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hustis. Um, oh, and ne uh, next is uh, Jeff Mead. No, no, you're, you're after you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. My name is Allie Hazel, um, Alexandra Hazel. I am in district number 10 um, in the Garden Springs area. Um, I own a couple of Airbnbs and also long-term rentals. And um, I agree with everything that Heath here said today. I have, there were a lot of things that I can echo and say, and I, I know that you said to, that if, if you don't want to hear it again, be repetitive. So I just wanted to say thank you and um, for being here today. And um, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mead. Hello. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Jeff Mead. I'm in District 6. I'm a small business owner. And as a, a former Marine and a Lexington police officer and a retired DEA agent, I certainly understand the need for a small amount of regulation. But uh, with that said, if it gets too cumbersome, as somebody already said, I'll just sell mine and take my investment out of county. Um, to just this week, I had a doctor call. He's uh, going to rent my place for three months. He's bringing his whole family. He made the remark, hey, I'm not putting my family in a hotel for three months. So he's going to be here three months with his two kids and his wife. They're going to spend money in our restaurants, going to get a local realtor. Um, you know, just something to keep in mind when, you, when you're sitting in these meetings. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Christy McCoy. And Christy, I think you have... 15 minutes. I'm not going to need my 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm Christy McCoy. Um, we have rentals in District 10. Um, and basically, I want to say thank you so much to Heath Green for eloquently saying exactly what we needed to say. And, um, and, and that's all. Thank you so much for working with, this and we, working with us. And we look forward to ironing out some of the details in this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Caught me off guard. Uh, Brenda O'Fork. 
Oh, yeah. Phil. That's what I said. <laughs> you know, I didn't uh, prepare properly to take notes. I'm a former teacher. So I'm really excited to be here because I'll just tell you my story. I'm near the Clays Ferry Palisades next to the property that's going to be the paddle park. My husband and I bought this property probably 1986 uh, or 7. This house was about to fall in. It was horrible. And my husband, being a plumbing contractor, and he likes to build stuff, it's three stories. And I started out our company, VRBO. I got my license, paid my sales tax, paid my hotel tax. I did everything. Then when we found out, okay, VRBO is going to pay these taxes, that was great. Well, now I've transitioned over. I'm still on VRBO, but I have a website. I am here to speak about the traveling nurses. I have had great responses with Furnish Finder having traveling nurses wanting to have a quiet place in the country that's short term. I don't charge a deposit. They have a three month lease and most of them stay for six months. They love it. They're out of state. They come in. All they want to do is sleep. So for the people out here that's renting with medical people, that's great. I also, <clears throat> there's two properties, and I don't know if they're going to speak tonight, that are Airbnbs. These properties were about to fall in on the river. And you've got to realize we were all flooded last year. The, the river got up in my house four foot, and I don't live there. I live in, I'm in District 7. It took us five weeks and about $50,000 to get the property where we could rent it. But I love doing this. As a retired teacher, my husband says, you just need to get out of it. But I love meeting all these people. My medical people are coming in from all across the country. They love it. Sometimes I'll make them biscuits. I'll take them homemade stuff. They, they really love Southern hospitality. I've actually taken them to Eastern Kentucky where our farm is. So I'm just, there, this has been very informative. I'm not even sure that we legally can rent. My husband's gonna kill me. Three different floors because I, we finally, I no, but I'm just being honest. I cannot operate the Kentucky River cottages if I cannot rent all three floors. And I just found this out about a month ago. We may not be in compliance. Oh my God, nobody ever told us, ignorance or whatever. I do know that these Airbnbs on the Kentucky River, on Beach Road, oh my gosh, I send people there. They love it. They love the owners, they love the host. And with COVID, that's kind of what really increased our occupancy. They didn't want to stay in a hotel. Oh my God, I worked my butt off. Clorox and spraying, washing everything, getting white tablecloths to make sure my property was COVID and safe. So all I want to say is I'm glad to come here as a, a agriculturalist and a farmer. I think it's important that if a farmer wants to have a house or something on their farm to let somebody stay in. Oh my God, how could you tell them no? We do not, hardly the small farmers are not raising tobacco. There's only small farmers. Sustainable agriculture is here in Fayette County. And if somebody wants to come to a farm and stay where they can get good food and vegetables, my God, let's don't overregulate it. Farmers are already regulated enough. Brenda Oldfield, District 7, thanks. <laughs> Don't clap, y'all. Don't clap. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Are we? All right. All right. Next on the list is uh, Karen Mundy. Ms. Mundy. I'm Karen Mundy. I live in District 12. I want to, to speak to you this evening about this because of a situation that we have run into. I live on Jack's Creek. We have a property that is um, contiguous to ours that has been rented to an outfitter, a hunting outfitter. One of our neighbors has dug a high-powered bullet out of the side of his house. We've had people shooting over top of our houses, across our properties, trespassing on our properties. Kathy Plowman has been fabulous to try to help us with this. This is a situation where an Airbnb is very dangerous in the AR. 
We have a situation that has happened that a property has been allowed to become uh, a rental, a short-term rental property. They usually come in on Friday, they leave on Sunday or Monday. Um, they are renting this to, we are told, at least 20 people are staying there on the weekends. Two weekends ago, we had people shooting across our properties, high-powered rifles. The other situation is, it is directly across the street from Raven Run Nature Sanctuary. We have people out there hiking. A high-powered bullet can carry a minimum of a mile. Depending on what they're shooting, these things can carry five miles. We've got moms and dads and kids directly across the road from this property. I don't think an Airbnb should be in an AR zone. If it is, there need to be tighter regulations. You probably are aware, as our councilwoman Kathy Plowman is aware, that an, a hunting outfitter is not allowed in the AR zone. We are now having to fight this. The city is behind us, and we are trying to get this resolved. But I don't want to go walk my dog in blaze orange every morning, and that's how us and all of our neighbors are feeling. So please, when you're looking at this, also look at some specific issues that come up from hunters, hunting outfitters, and those kinds of things in the AR zone. I'm not against short-term rentals. I think they have a purpose and a place, and I think Breeders' Cup was certainly um, uh, a, a much more pleasant situation because of that. But because of our situation, I have been made aware that there are some dangerous situations that come, can come up because of short-term rentals. Thank you guys for considering this. When I served on the Planning Commission, we started looking at it, and I'm glad it's finally coming to some resolve. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Mundy. Uh, next is, I think I can, all right, is Dottie Bean. And then behind, next is Breck, <coughs> Breck Withers. What's that last name? I'm Dottie Bean in the 8th District. Uh, council members, we see several problems with this proposal so far as it permits transient people to stay within Lexington neighborhoods for up to 30 days with no way of supervising or limiting their activities and access to children and others who depend on you to for protecting their safety in their own homes. We also oppose this proposal on the grounds it is likely to take rental property in developing marginalized neighborhoods off the markets. We have so many homeless people. We do not want to have more. Um, we are, uh, I've been talking to you all for the past two or three weeks about all this. This is exactly what I'm talking about taking houses away from Lexington residents and flipping them and using them for profit. We believe this, these efforts to turn Lexington into a destination city will have a very detrimental effect on its character, safety, and morals. We already have large transient populations at two universities here in Lexington, and we know the problems those populations have caused for our neighborhoods near the universities. Please do not pass this ordinance on. It is a bad idea. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mr. Withers. Hello, Council. I'm Breck Withers. Uh, my wife and I live in Gardenside. We just re-elected Miss Reynolds by, I think, 70 some percent. Uh, I think we could have done. You could have done a little better. Um, we, uh, our family's real deep in the community here, um, and um, we've been involved for many, many years in low and in income, uh, low income, moderate housing, and. Um, 
we have, uh, since we started, I, I bought a little house that I lived next to that was boarded up and animals running and out and people running and out. And that's how we got into the short-term rental business. It, I shared a driveway with it. And, um, and, uh, and it's kind of grown from there. And we've kind of renovated some other homes and, and uh, have them as, as short-term rentals. Um, but we've kept our low and moderate income housing and make no, no mistake, the short-term rentals keep the keep us being able to do the short, the uh, low income housing. Um, we delivered a $8,000 HVAC system to a family that's been in a home for 10 years and that home will make zero money for the next three years. And so, you know, this helps us do that. And I don't know, we probably have about 35 low income housing. We work with the housing authority and other agencies to provide housing. And uh, the, the, the STRs 100% help us get to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Gary Condester. Did I say that right? Okay. <laughs> try it, man, try it. 62 years. <laughs> it's a hard one. My name is Gary Chedester, and I thank you for this opportunity as the uh, chairperson for in planning and zoning in Danville and Bull County for a handful of years. I appreciate what you're undertaking here. I'm very grateful. Um, I'm here representing the Farm LLC in Danville. Um, started 10 years ago, started in Danville. Um, it has expanded to 26 different properties that we now manage. Um, three of those are in Fayette County. One of them is 2680 Our Native Lane behind Calumet Farm, 1911 Parker's Mill inside the loop, and we have one here near um, Kroger Field. Um, I am so grateful for this man right here. <laughs> I'm going to keep my time really short because he said just about everything that we needed, we wanted to say. I would just like to ditto one, a couple things if I could. Um, we really need you to consider the grandfather. If that was a possibility, with the Farm LLC, bringing a gun and shooting a gun on any of our properties is prohibited. Miss Monday's, Miss Monday's testimony a few minutes ago, I'm sorry. That's not what the farm does. I don't believe that's what a lot of us are doing. Um, and we're being thrown into, transient people do not come and stay at our places. The stories that we have of um, athletic students, parents coming to UK and staying in our homes. We keep the parking all inside the property of where we're at. Um, the, this one that we have at 2680 Our Native Lane is behind Calumet Farm. People walk away feeling like they stayed on a horse farm for eight days. Um, and we're just so grateful for that. We thank God for that. They come with families, they come with friends, um, they experience Central Kentucky, and we're very, very grateful. Is there bad? I, I completely, I, I'm sure of it. I'm sorry, Julie, that you got to deal with the park. That's the reason why I believe it's so important. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's the reason why we got to have an ordinance. And I thank you for the consideration. I thank you for what my brother shared, and I just ask that, um, that um, all of this be taken into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Rachel, Rachel Johnson, and uh, you have six minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I do want to say that some of my comments might come off as a little abrasive. I haven't really had a time to fine tune my thoughts. Um, but my name is Rachel Johnson, and I reside on 861 Honeysuckle Road. I have attended all the public. Um, city Council meetings where Airbnb ordinances were discussed and I've shared my experience as an Airbnb host and how Airbnb has changed my life. I am a single mother on disability. My SS benefits barely put me over the poverty level. Last year my income increased by $20,000. The income from the previous year I reinvested into home improvements. 
my home went from $145,000 to $250,000 in three years. I've had three neighbors stop by and personally thank me for our street, making our street more appealing, and they hoped it would inspire others on our street to make more improvements. I now have $60,000 in home equity and $35,000 in my savings account. I did not have this three years ago. And due to my disease, I can't work in a normal work environment. Short-term rentals has allowed me, a disabled single mother, and others who would never be able to supplement their income in any other way, even if I can't maintain this kind of performance each year, I'll still be above the poverty level. I also want to discuss the lack of data that's been collected and considered in this draft. Can you provide the facts about how many Airbnb disturbances there were? How many times the police were called? What resulted after the police were called? Arrests, fines? Who were the repeat offenders? As the Airbnb community or short-term rental community, we want to know these things too. We want to be good neighbors. And as for decreasing the stock of affordable houses, there is currently only 1,400 short-term rentals in Lexington. That's less than 1% of the current housing supply. It's actually 0.007%. Even insinuating that short-term rentals have played a factor in the housing shortage is really a red herring. Another housing shortage red herring is to blame short-term rentals for increased home values by reducing the number of available homes. Once again, there's less than 1% short-term rentals in Lexington. And how many of those short-term rentals are in someone's private home? How many are ADUs? Neither of these reduce available housing, and that would even bring it below 0.005%. And has this committee, or this committee and council members tried to dismiss this misconception that I've even heard here with recent comments? One could come to the conclusion these proposed ordinances could be a political straw man, using ST short-term rentals to show constituents how you are addressing the shortage crisis when the facts and data don't line up? Are you trampling on the rights of a few just to secure re-election and appease your more affluent and political contributors? That's the kind of abrasive of part <laughs> that I wish I could have fine-tuned. It was just off the cuff, um, you know, thoughts that I was writing down. And as for trying to gather information from both sides, I've gleaned from the short-term hosts that have been included in some of these discussions that little of their input is reflected in the proposed ordinances. And I've also heard, and Mr. Brown did address this, um, that some council members have commented that they have only heard from constituents that don't want short-term rentals in their neighborhoods and not from the short-term rental host. We haven't had a draft to respond to until now. And it's my understanding from the hosts who did participate in your discussions that the council is trying to push through this before the end of the year. That's our understanding. Um, that short-term community has not had adequate time to hear or to respond to this current draft. It would be an overreach and a derelict of duty for this committee to push this draft through and vote. So I do hope that you give more time for discussion and more um, insight into this process. I am all for ordinances that ensure a safe environment for our guests. Taxes should be collected. Fees should be collected. There should be a way of tracking habitual nuisances of, and offenders and singling out the bad short-term rental hosts. That should be removed from um, this platform. But as of yet, these proposals are ambiguous. It leaves the door open for misinterpretations and could later even be weaponized for ulterior political motives. So once again, I do please consider you to take more time in this draft. Um, my partner has conceded his time to me and I just wanna discuss a little bit about his eight listings. Six of them were actually located in one building in your district, Mr. Brown. And we really have tried to be good neighbors. Um, several of our neighbors have even rented out several of our Airbnbs at once for family members that have come in from out of town. He started these up in 2017, currently has eight listings, 563 raving reviews with a 97.4 five star rating. For the last 365 days, he has had 900 night bookings. 
He has over the 365 days booking value of $169,000. And 15% of that goes towards taxes and fees and the transient tax. So we are contributing to our city and the development of our city and maintaining a quality of life for all local residents. And once again, as they said, we're ambassadors. One of his Airbnbs has been featured twice on Lexington 18, like the Kentucky Taste Buds, ABC 36 News, an international travel outlet, and just this week on Fox 17 out of Nashville, a direct quote from that feature says, grab your bag and head to Lexington. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, next on the list is Marcus Tailfair. Tailfair? He may be We're going to give them a few seconds. I think they might be outside. After Mr. Tailfair is Whitney Reynolds. And then is it Rhea Rivera? So Marcus Tailfair, Whitney Reynolds, and then Rhea Rivera. Are they coming? And just a reminder, just state your name and uh, your council district. And Mr. Telfair, I think you got six minutes. Oh, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Marcus Telfair, um, co-owner of My Sugar. It's an Airbnb cleaning company. Uh, I live in District 12. Um, I just want to say um, this evening that I'm here because, um, and be a little bit before COVID, um, before the pandemic started, we uh, opened our business. Like everybody in here in the uh, FCR community, everybody steps out on faith. So that's what we had to step out on. Um, since then, um, that's been our stream of income. Um, being a part of the FCR community, able my family business to thrive, it grows um, tremendously. Um, it's able to, it's able us to put our daughter in college. It's about to put our son in college. Um, they do more than just host. Um, it's a personal, tight-knit community. It's growing rapidly. Um, everyone here is personal. They're almost uh, spokesmen for the city, uh, spokesmen for uh, the state of Kentucky. Um, we're just glad to be a part of it. And uh, we just want you guys to know that it's bigger than just um, open up, opening up your doors and letting people come in. It's so personal. It's ridiculous. Um, every owner and operator here is a branch to another family. Um, if it wasn't for um, these business owners and operators of, of these STRs, uh, I would be able to take care of my family the way I do. Um, and I wouldn't be able to employ our employees. So it's a ripple effect. Um, and it keeps your eye open for more local business owners because when you see uh, how much is contributed into um, these homes and how much it transforms these neighborhoods and the security it brings in these neighborhoods, um, it feels good to be a part of that. Uh, change is easy to speak about, but uh, being part of it is, is a bigger, is an even bigger effect. And I just thank you guys for giving me your time. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Whitney Reynolds. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Whitney Reynolds, and I live in the first district near Castlewood Park. I also had the privilege of working for an affordable housing nonprofit. We know we're in a housing crisis and have been for a while now. Lexington saw an 18% increase in rent last year, a higher increase than most of the country. The National Low Income Housing Coalition also tells us that a Lexingtonian must make almost $18 an hour to afford a two bedroom apartment. Lexington does not have enough housing available for our citizens. So how does this fit in with short term rentals? 
A rough count shows over 20 short-term rentals available in the area directly around Castlewood Park, where I live, and the majority are owned by the same three owners or management companies. There, those are 20 homes or apartments that could be housing residents of our city. Am I asking or expecting these short-term rentals to go away? No, yay capitalism. What's being proposed today won't solve our housing shortage and won't solve our homeless issues, but fees, licenses, and registries seem like the least we can do. The city of Bardstown, a tourist destination that touts historic homes, world-class bourbon, and maybe a high school football state championship after this weekend, has done what Lexington is proposing and then some, and their short-term rental business is doing just fine. I know I'm in the minority today, so thank you for listening, and thank you for remembering to put our most vulnerable citizens first. That's all. Thank you. Who is uh, Barstown playing? Are they playing Frederick Douglass? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, you're fine then. All right, next is Rhea Rivera. All right, so do you know who she, Ray, do you know who she wants to give her time to? Is it Hunter? Okay. Uh, well, go, go ahead and come up. Are you, what's your name? Are you signed up? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm signed up. What's your name? Evan Turgo. All right, well, come up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we'll take you now. And you have six minutes. I got my notes from my wife, so. Um, hey, I got my. Adnan Turgo, District 5. I, uh, Heath has said a lot of good things, so I'm just not gonna drone on about all the things. But I think a lot of the concerns that everybody brought up doesn't really apply to STR. Um, somebody mentioned Motel 6. Anybody in this room that runs an STR, we don't run it like a motel. Uh, it's very personable. We know a lot of the guests. We know a lot of the hosts in this room. Um, it's on a very local, intimate level. We also <clears throat> get along with our guests, fellow hosts, and when we do meet the guests, we try to give them the local hospitality. Um, I don't know about you, but Motel 6 is owned by a Wall Street bank, and you'll never meet those owners. Uh, I met so many good owners here, and everybody takes pride in their STRs. Um, I also think <clears throat> somebody mentioned that STRs are equitable. Um, Someone put their kids through college. Someone built businesses around it. Um, additional income, paid mortgages off, things like that. Um, as far as parking, I don't think uh, putting a ban on STRs will fix the parking issue. Um, I think there is ways to regulate it. We have, uh, you can register cars. We usually ask how many people park when we host. But it doesn't really stop people from inviting friends or family. And I think long-term rentals, We'll have six, seven cars as well. Uh, so that really doesn't solve the issue. Um, somebody had mentioned here about shootings at the STR. Um, I don't, I see a lot of shootings happening in long-term rentals too, uh, apartment buildings, houses. There's no way to regulate that. And it's really not so much on the STR host as it is on the people that are staying there. Um, believe it or not, you can call Airbnb and complain about the host or complain about the guests and Airbnb will contact the host directly, and they will shut it down, and they will shut us down. Um, I've, had, I've had somebody complain about construction noise from the house next door, and Airbnb called us to say, hey, can you do something about it? There wasn't much we could do, but they hold us as hosts accountable, and our reviews show that. Um, when you look up the reviews of every STR in this room, 4.5 and up, great reviews, 97, 98%. Uh, you look up hotels, you look up Motel 6, even the Hiltons and all that, four stars. Uh, and again, you don't know who's, who you rented from. I, I've never met the owner of Hilton or Motel 6, and I've stayed there. So, But every STR owner I've met, I've actually met a few friends too, guy in uh, LA, guy in, uh, I stayed in somebody's basement in Gulf Shores because I screwed up on my own booking <laughs> and I had to sleep in his basement, but made great friends with him, had a beer, great guy. I knew him locally, and uh, we still stay in touch on Facebook. But, um, I think what this is to me, uh, it hurts people economically taking their opportunity to rent a room or a couch. Airbnb was started with an air mattress. Um, and 
it helps people, you know, I met a, somebody yesterday, uh, she, single mom, she put her, she rents two of her bedrooms out in her house and uh, she's putting her daughter through private school because of it. She's paying off her mortgage. So it's very equitable and it helps people who may be, who may not have the careers, who may not have the education, who may have disabilities or issues, but it helps them gain financial independence over time, slowly. Um, I believe the average rental that Lexington gets about $140 a night. Um, this isn't a Hilton, this isn't a $60 billion corporation. This is a mom, a dad, husband, wife, uh, son, daughter, just trying to pay the mortgage, trying to put their kids, trying to better their lives. So <clears throat> I also think, uh, and I can probably speak for everybody here, for the STR owners, I think when we do run a property, whether we own it or manage it or help manage it, uh, we take a lot of pride in it. Um, every time we have a guest stay and I've had guests complain about a light bulb being burnt out, it got changed the next day. Um, any kind of trash outside anything, it gets addressed right away because we don't want those bad reviews. Unlike long-term rentals, I think a long-term rental can get dilapidated. Most of the owners are out of state. You know, some goes wrong, some's broke. Nobody really addresses it. It just gets run down. Um, I also think that me personally, and maybe a little radical, <laughs> I think uh, STRs will be the future of rentals for everything. Um, I think you have a middle ground there. You got a host, you got a guest, and then things run through a central system through Airbnb to where they can regulate and hold people accountable for. So we have to provide good quality, safe homes to the guests, and the guests have to provide, they have to respect the host rules. Unlike long-term rentals where you don't know <clears throat> how the landlord's gonna run it, you don't know how the people rent it will take care of it. Uh, I don't even know if they're gonna pay for it. And you never know, uh, you never know how safe the home will be, but with short-term rentals, the minute something goes out, if a smoke detector doesn't have batteries, it's on the review, we get contacted right away, and we have to address it. So I think personally, I think that's the future. I think rentals will be better down the road, but you know, for now, I think it's just gonna be visitors and guests, so. And one more thing, if I can. Um, Somebody mentioned about too much traffic, too many visitors coming to Lexington, and just rough numbers. I Googled about two minutes ago. Um, Lexington gets about, I think it said about 300,000 visitors a year, maybe 600,000. Uh, we have a property in Gulf Shores that gets about uh, 8 million a year. Uh, the city is about 15,000 people. Uh, they get about 8 million visitors every year, about $7.1 billion in economic contributions. So, you know. We don't have to go that crazy, but <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Next is Hunter Matthews, Fidelio. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Fidelio Rojas. Rojas. Rojas or Rojas. So how did I, what I, I say wrong? All of it? Good evening, everyone. My name is Fidelia Rojas, and I am a small business owner as a housekeeper for both residential and short-term rentals. I have been in this business for 27 years across multiple states, including California, Oregon, and here in Kentucky. I have been working in Kentucky for some of these business owners for, ever, for over 20 years. I started in residential only, but as some of my clients started growing their rental business, it allowed me to grow my small business as well. I have been able to create jobs for people right here in our community. Through this steady income, my team is able to support their families. Many of my employees are single mothers and are, and are the head of their household. Without these short-term rentals, I will not be, have the cap capacity to contribute to our local economy as much as I have and to employ these ladies and support their families. A significant portion of my business is dedicated to short-term rentals. We are very 
appreciated to be trust with our business. Short-term rentals also fill a need in our city that supports tourism. This is helping support local business around major, major events hosted here, making our city a place people want to be visit time and time again. We appreciate the opportunity to serve our community and to support families and a single moms working hard to make a living. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next is Fran Taylor. Um, Cynthia. Cynthia Trapp. Trago. Pergo. Oh, you got it. Okay. Uh, Randy Sa. Did I say that? Nah. Let's see. Try. How's it going, guys? Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, it's just great hearing from like all these other hosts. Like, I'm not the only one that has these same feelings that we're going through. Um, I have two homes in District 1, one in District 10, one in District 3. I live in District 7. I'm fortunate enough to uh, have grown up in the hotel business. Uh, my family has done that all their life. So whenever I saw short-term rentals started, I was like, man, this is like another opportunity because as we could tell, other guests have been going to these avenues of business. A lot of people aren't liking hotels as much. No big deal. Like I said, it's just another avenue. Um, things have accelerated a lot like this past two years because of COVID and like these regulations that we're trying to get, we need to figure it out. But at the end, we also need to meet in the middle. I think it's a big thing. Um, you know, like I said, with uh, a lot of people's brought up everything, like Heath over here is like the all-star of all that we've kind of wanted to get off our chest, but we've like employed, you know, like whenever we fix up these houses, we're employ uh, employing construction workers, cleaners, people to fix our um, utilities, fix our air conditioners. So we're trying to stimulate the economy at the same way. Um, and we are also paying taxes on our properties. So at the end, it's like another avenue for the city and the government to like kind of accelerate more revenue into our stream. Um, the only thing like I'm kind of like, a lot of this stuff's already been talked about. Just, I guess my thing is a lot of people has already invested money in some existing places. So I was hoping we could like find a way to get like a grandfather clause on things that have been already put in place. So let's just say there was like a hard hammer on us shutting down or us like in different areas, because I know some of my houses are probably like in residential areas, but they're also up and coming areas. So. I feel like I invested a lot of my personal money and my, my time, and it would just be a shame just for all this hard work that we've all put in to, to close down or shut or sell our, our home because essentially as we have mortgages to pay and we, you know, we, we, we pretty much took these homes to make money as a business, but also to help bring in people to our community. So that's kind of like what I wanted to bring up. Um, just more clarification on the zoning. Um, I know we're still in the early process of this and there's like not a timeline, but you know, I didn't know what we could do as host to help bring our information. I know we could email and you know, you, I don't want you guys get flooded with so much information, but I guess there's a way that we could make it work to where we could all work together to make sure that we all meet in the middle. That's kind of like where I wanted to come here and actually like bring my voice in. So, but thank you guys. All right. Thank you. Joe Gothrop. Joe Gothrop. So it's Joe Gothrop. Yeah, I think they might still be outside. Uh, D. Miller. Lois. <laughs> um, is it Laura Combs? Maybe I'll just start saying email addresses. Yeah. Yep. So Joe Gothrop, <clears throat> D. Miller, and it looks like Laura Combs. All right. So we'll see if they're if they're coming. 
Julie Lark. Julia Lark. Okay. Amy Clark. Amy, you weren't here before six o'clock. <laughs> we know you weren't. Ms. Brown, I have about a week to review the, the legislation. Well, I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, Thank you. I'm Amy Clark of 628 Castle Road. That's in the third district. Um, you have a lengthy letter in front of you with some of my concerns. Uh, I sort of grouped it into five. Um, I will say to begin with, one thing is clear, transient rental use, and you have now defined by these drafts, uh, short-term rental use as transient. It's for people who have a permanent residence elsewhere. I believe it doesn't belong independent of an owner-operator in the residential zones. If there's an owner-operator here, we had lots of wonderful stories about people who welcomed a guest into their home and earned enough money to put their kid through college and so on. That's a different matter. I ask that both the municipal ordinance, that's the licensing and fees and the oversight to some extent, and the ZODA remain in committee till far greater clarity and accord is reached. There's been a nine months committee working 12 meetings. We saw this a week ago. It needs more discussion uh, from all aspects. I agree with people on both sides of the issue on that. Um, five concerns and questions. The ordinances would usurp residentially zoned land for transient and commercial use as a hotel, uh, uh, transient uh, lodging is a commercial use. Consider that the net profits last year from these um, Airbnb and VRBO listed rentals alone came to 11.4 million. That's working backward from the tax collected. Well, this year the council budgeted 10 million in ARPA money and several million more in regular allocations to uh, stimulate the production and sometimes just the preservation or restoration of affordable housing. How many units does that buy? And how many units? So 10 million plus, 11.4 million. Uh, we're working at cross purposes if we give regulatory incentive or allowance to converting residential land for transient uses. What parent with children or seniors to support can compete with hotelier in bidding on a house? And this is something we see all the time in our neighborhood with student rental. Well, then along comes short-term rental and the yield can be even higher. And we've got a situation where families can't afford to live there. Key regulations have been relaxed or key restrictions have been relaxed or eliminated. Four makes a family, four makes a household is being rescinded, the 2010 ZODA that established that for rental use is being rescinded by this proposal. It's not even clear how many people. Ms. Clark, I'm sorry. You're I'm gonna beg for another minute, maybe two, but not three. Um, just to kind of keep us on schedule, Ms. Mm -hmm. Clark, I'm gonna be, can you wrap up in a few seconds? Well, I will say that the duration of rental stay has been removed altogether. I agree that it's unenforceable, but the better course would be to say that a short-term rental has to be one month, not more frequent than one month, and then it would be enforceable because it wouldn't be here today, gone tomorrow. I will also say it, within the, the legislation, it's not clear on hosted sites that the resident landowner need be resident during the rental stay. You bo boogie off to Florida and some hooligans <laughs> do something with your house and you're not even there to know it. Um, what are the duties of the licensee, the owner, versus what could be a rental manager? We had this um, rifle 
um, outfitter managing a number of rentals. It, it isn't clear to me in that ordinance. So I think that needs clarifying before it's advanced to council yes, for consideration and adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. The rest, the rest was, of my remarks was, are in the record. Yes, ma'am. Was there anyone that signed up to speak that didn't get recognized inside or outside the council chamber? We're at the end of our list. Um, yeah. Can you check out there and just make sure nobody out there signed up to speak? Is there? Okay. Is there, and, and there's no, is there anybody in here that wanted an opportunity, or is there anybody that wanted an opportunity to speak that didn't get an opportunity? Yes, yes, sir, let's go here and then go here. Just come to the podium, give your name and council district. You have three minutes. Um, I got here early and looked at the crowd and didn't sign up to speak and a uh, big mistake because now I'm here, I'm here at the end, it's at seven o'clock. Uh, I'm John Hackworth, I live in the first district. Um, and I wanna say that I'm a big supporter of uh, short-term rentals. Uh, I hope that the, whatever ordinance that you pass uh, has, um, uh, uh, gives a lot of leeway to the, to the short-term rental uh, owner. Uh, I stay in them all over the country. Uh, I think they're wonderful. It's a no-brainer that the people that are the short-term rental people, I mean, if I stay in a place and it's lousy, I'm gonna, I mean, those are the ones you write about and you know mostly unless it's just terrific and you know it's so anyway th those people uh, are going to police their properties and make them as good as they can possibly make them if they have any sense and if they have any business sense because that's what will make them successful um, and I do hope that uh, the situation whatever it is will be grandfathered um, fewer regulations are better than more regulations these people self-police themselves. My concern is with, <laughs> I've said all these wonderful things about uh, short-term rental properties. Uh, my concern is with the density of the non-resident owner of short-term rentals. I live in a neighborhood, it's a small neighborhood. We have one street in our neighborhood where 50% of the street is short-term rentals. Uh, and those, I'm very concerned, and this is, not, and I've been saying this, and Mr. Brown, you know this, uh, I've been saying it for three years now, uh, I'd like to see something like what's in Louisville, where they have a, and again, everybody that's got a short-term rental, it'd be grandfathered in, if you have them in an apartment building, I don't care, you know, that on, I'm concerned about our neighborhoods, protecting and preserving our neighborhoods. And if you have 50% of a street that's short-term rentals, you have lost a lot of your neighborhood. And I can see my neighborhood in 15 years becoming 60% short-term rentals. Um, uh, I mean, it's a very profitable business, uh, certainly in the area, downtown area where I live. Uh, so uh, to, just to cut it short, I, I think that, or uh, to finish, uh, that it needs to be, uh, we need to have this uh, uh, density situation looked at very carefully and somewhere in the ordinance. And most, uh, many, many uh, uh, cities do this, and I think that should be considered. And I don't think it's, it's I can't find it in the ordinance uh, and, uh, as of yet. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Perryman. I'm in the 12th district with Kathy Plowman. Um, I serve on the Blackford Oaks board. Um, we have roughly a thousand homes. Um, we have five Airbnbs operating in there, and we haven't had any issues. Now, saying that, we are an HOA, so we're able to put in policies small government, and prevent HOAs. And I know there's a lot of regulations out there that aren't being used to regulate HOA, or to regulate STR, sorry, I apologize. Um, we have, you know, that sheet, you can only rent out for 52 times a year, 
and a few other, you know, zoning has to be zoned correctly, but there's no enforcement on the existing regulations we have for STR, all right? So what is bringing all this regulation in gonna solve? It's, it's not gonna solve anything if we're not already enforcing what we already have. So I, am, I implore you guys to look into other options, education. Hey, education's a, a really good way of making people aware of what's going on. In our HOA, for instance, we have bylaws, but most people don't know they exist. But if we can educate that, hey, we have things in place that can help you run your business and do it successfully, and what's allowed and what's not allowed before we start throwing regulations out there. So I think there's a lot of different avenues we can explore before we get to this bombardment of regulation. Um, to speak on the housing crisis, I'm a real estate agent. Um, I'm very blessed. Um, I work with a lot of first-time home buyers. I also uh, fight apartment complexes that are getting that rezone areas because they need more population density. The reason why we need more population density is because we're not extending the sewer lines, the, the urban county line. That is going to be what's going to solve your issue with short, or with housing. It's not going to be t wiping out 1,400 short-term rentals. That I mean, that may be a band-aid, but your your solution is to build more housing not to restrict the way housing is used. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have no